Good morning, everybody. It is indeed great to see you on a beautiful Sabbath morning. I am so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. I can't believe it's already uh, <clears throat> just a few minutes away from sunset, and I'm finally getting a chance to be able to record this today. It's been an interesting day, to say the least, as far as computer things go. My computer decided that it wanted to go through an update, and it has not been a pleasant experience, which also required me to upgrade some software, which also was not a pleasant experience. But hey, we're here now, and we're ready to worship with you, and I hope that we'll all receive a blessing out of our sermon today. Turn with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 13, verses 34 and 35 for a scripture reading today. Luke chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. And I'll put them up on the screen for you. Luke chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to her, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you will, n but you will not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, and assuredly I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear, kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to spend time together, and we ask a blessing upon our worship service today. We ask this in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen. The title for our lesson is Finally, a home-cooked meal. Who of us here today doesn't like a good home-cooked meal? Or sitting down to a banquet that has been especially prepared for a special occasion, such as Thanksgiving, which is coming up in less than a month. Ah, the smell of the fresh food, especially prepared for a feast of Thanksgiving, which is a wonderful holiday, it is indeed my favorite of all holidays. I just really love Thanksgiving. Perhaps you have fond memories, as I do, of spending Christmas, not Christmas, excuse me, Thanksgiving with my cousins in Minneapolis and and traveling down and then going back to Brainerd that evening. Um, but it was always so much fun to spend the time with my cousins on Thanksgiving Day. And I really appreciate the hospitality that my aunt and uncle gave us each Thanksgiving as we would come and, and spend Thanksgiving with their family. There were a few occasions in which we had Thanksgiving at our house, but because there was six kids, there were six cousins all in one family, it was easier for us, me being the only child, for us to go to them and bring my grandma with versus all them, all of them coming to our house. So Thanksgiving was a special time, and I really, really enjoyed Christmas with family and the smell of the fresh made food, the breads baking, the, and everything that goes along with Thanksgiving. In Luke chapter 14, we have a parable told by Christ of a great supper, especially prepared for those who had been invited. In fact, Luke chapter 14, verse 16 says, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. Verse 17 says, And then sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. 
but they all with one accord began to make excuses. Something wonderful had been attempted. Somebody had planned this wonderful event and invited the people, but when the time came to partake of the wonderful home-cooked meal, they began to make excuses. Earlier in chapter 14, Christ had illustrated the cause behind all these excuses. Turn with me to Luke chapter 14, verse 1. Luke chapter 14, verse 1. As soon as we begin to read this passage in Luke chapter 14, verse 1, some of you are going to recognize this right away. This is the seventh miracle that Jesus has performed on a Sabbath. And so in Luke chapter 14, verse 1, The passage starts out this way. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath. This statement is significant because it shows us Jesus is still answering the accusation against Jesus by the religious leaders in their con conversation with the disciples in Luke chapter 5, verse 30, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And in Luke chapter 15, verse 1, we see this issue come up again. Let's turn to Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Luke chapter 15, verse 1 is just a page or two over from where we were at. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Actually, this discourse on why Jesus associates and eats with sinners continued from Luke chapter 5, verse 30, all the way through the end of chapter 16. But in Luke 14, starting in verse 1, Jesus is, introduces us to the heart of the problem, and sorry for the pun, but you'll see it in just a moment. Luke chapter 14, again, verse 1, now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. The fact that they're watching him closely should indicate that we also need to pay attention to what's happening in the passage. Verse 2 says, And behold, there was a certain man with him who had dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the, Pharisee, or the lawyer and the Pharisees. Now I want you to understand they hadn't said a word, but Jesus was reading their thoughts. And so he says, and Jesus answering, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Is it good to do good? Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath. There are three things at stake in this passage. Two are obvious. They are the question of eating and associating with sinners, and the other is the proper Sabbath observance. The third issue is not so obvious. This man, who was in the ruler of the Pharisee's house, had a disease called dropsy. This is significant because it plays a role into what happens all the way to the end of chapter 16. Why is it significant? You see, some Bible scholars have suggested that this man was suffering from some sort of an addiction that caused him to have an ailment. I can agree, but it isn't a physical condition as such as alcohol or some other addiction. The addiction this man suffered from is the addiction of sin. All of us 
have a tendency of suffering from that addiction to sin. You see, the original issue with our first parents is that they failed to trust in God, which caused a heart condition. Instead of the heart being outward focused or other centered, the heart became inward focused or focused upon self rather than others. In Bible times, dropsy is what we would call congestive heart failure, or that's what it would be known as today. Today we call it edema in which the body stores excessive water, usually caused by congestive heart failure. It can also be caused by kidneys and liver issue, but typically it's it's because of a uh, heart condition. Therefore, this man who was at this feast that Jesus was invited to on the Sabbath was suffering from a condition of the heart. He had a heart disease. He had a physical condition, but he also had a spiritual condition of the heart as well. How do we know this? Let's look at the story that follows. Let's pick up the story in Luke chapter 14, verse 7. Luke chapter 14, verse 7. There in Luke chapter 14, verse 7, So he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. The him in this case would be the the master of the ceremonies, the one that is the host of the event. And he who invited you and him, this him would be the other guest that would be more important than you, as we're about to see. When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And now in verse 9, and he who invited you and him comes to you, give place to this man, and then, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. Verse 10. But when you are invited, go sit down, says Jesus, in the lowest place. So that when you are invited, you come, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will give glory to the presence of those who sit at the table with you. It's an indication that God is wanting us to have a servant type of a of a attitude. He wants us to be willing to serve and to not place ourselves in front of others. We may be exalted by others to a place of honor, but we shouldn't seek that place for ourselves. In the next few verses, Jesus can gives a suggestion on who you should invite to the feast if prepared, that is prepared. Then in verse 15, now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is he who eats the bread in the kingdom of God. I'm telling you what, I am so looking forward to being able to partake of the food of heaven someday. And not only of heaven once we go to heaven, but when we come back to earth, can you imagine spending that first Sabbath day with our Creator here on an earth made new? Perhaps there was hope in the room after all, but notice what Jesus' response. So I'm going to read verse 15 again and then read on to 16. 
Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to Jesus, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. It appears as though this guy gets it, but wait a minute. Verse 16 says, A certain man gave a great supper, invited many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to, the, to those who are invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But verse 18 says, But they were with one accord, began to make excuses. <clears throat> Things can happen in life that could possibly keep us away from an event like this. But Jesus is trying to make an incredible point. <coughs> He's trying to make an incredible point. This was to be a celebration and all celebrations. They all had received their invitation, but when it came time for the celebration to begin, their hearts were filled with thoughts of self and not for others. The things in their life became more important than celebrating the victories in another person's life. Therefore, they did not heed the invitation, but went about their own business, attending to their own affairs. They thought of every excuse in the book not to go. To emphasize the point, Luke, our New Testament historian, doctor, and author, grabs another event in the life of Christ and inserts it here to give us an illustration. This event comes from the height of Christ's ministry. We see in verse 25 of chapter 14 that great multitudes were following Jesus. He wanted to be sure their hearts were in the right place. When you've got a lot of people following you, they all follow for different reasons. And Jesus wanted to make sure that their heart was all in the right place, in the right condition. And so he says in verse 23, or 26, excuse me, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father, mother, wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life, he cannot be my disciples. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, we see in verse 27, cannot be my disciple. Jesus is using the Jewish idiom to make a point. An idiom is when you say one thing, but mean something different. Jesus had used the word hate when he said this. The point he's trying to make is that Jesus wants us to love all. He wants us to love our spouses. He wants us to love our children. He wants us to love our mothers and fathers. He wants us to love all that are around us. But he uses the word hate to, to get us to understand that we should love these less than we do our relationship with God. What did Christ have to do to become like us? He had to lay down self and submit himself. Submit himself even to the point of death and beyond. Yet Christ had remained faithful and at one minute with our Heavenly Father. And it's that at one minute with the Heavenly Father I want to concentrate on here just for a few moments as we close our sermon today. In the Old Testament, God used circumcision to illustrate the atonement that should exist between myself or the children of Israel and God. I use myself as an example because God wants to be at one with me like he wants to be at one with each and every one of us that are here today. 
if we are at one with God, then we will have all the right relationships with others. Our focus will be on the well-being of others and not of our own self-interests and desires. The call of Abraham that we see in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, is about Abraham becoming at one with God so that through God, Abraham, God could bless the world with the good news of the gospel. But Abraham, from the end of Genesis 11 through the end of Genesis chapter 13, kept trying to put things between himself and God, attempting to allow the everyday things to be more important than trusting in God. He didn't value Sarah, but he valued her enough that he would call her her sister instead, instead of relying upon God to protect him. After all, God said he was going to be a mighty nation. He allowed Hagar to get in the way, and instead of allowing God to work things out in his life, Abraham finally got it in that he entertained angels and had a meal prepared for them, then begged for Sodom and Gomorrah to be spared. This was confirmed in the offering of Isaac as a sacrifice, that he was indeed at one with God, believing God would provide. His heart was in the right place. His thinking had become other-centered. Jeremiah picks up this theme in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Let's turn to it together. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Keep your thumb in Luke, because we're going to come back to that in just a moment. Jeremiah picks up this theme in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4, where Jeremiah says, Circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your hearts. It's a tie in. The story of the man with the dropsy that Jesus healed had a heart condition. And here Jeremiah is talking to the children of Israel and saying, you've got a heart condition. The foreskin of your heart needs to be removed so that you can have an, a, a, a relationship with God so that you can be at one with God. You men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire because of the evil of your doings. If we are in tune with God, if we are at one with God, and the whole idea of circumstance, circumcision was to illustrate our at one with God and his desires for our life. Here Jeremiah is saying, our hearts need to become one with God. Our selfish desires need to be pushed away so that we can partake of the supper. Let's read it together in Luke 24, 14. Luke 24, 14. Let's read it together as we close here. Luke 24, 14, For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my supper. They didn't taste of the supper that was specifically and especially prepared for them. Why? Because they allowed other things than a good, close relationship with God to interfere with their life and keep them from the important things. God's preparing a supper for each and every one of us. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I can hardly wait to partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Therefore, we are invited by Christ to love him more than all these 
that we might partake of the great home-cooked meal that will be prepared for you and I when we are when we are with Christ forever and ever. But the only way this is going to happen, and I'm not trying to suggest that works in any way saves us, I'm asking us to have the faith of Abraham where we finally get it and become other-centered, looking out for the good of others instead of the good of ourselves. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to open the scriptures and study together. And I ask that we will have received a blessing from this and may the words resonate with us and may we become other-centered looking out for the good of others versus what's pleasing to ourselves. We ask this in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen.